right now that this show is by royal appointment this morning. It's not officially, but we are going to be commemorating, celebrating 200 years of Queen Victoria. Not on the throne, of course, although for some of her citizens it must have felt like that. 200 years ago this week, her marriage, Queen Victoria was born. She shaped a whole generation, the Victorian era. She, I think, was grandmother to pretty much nearly all, had connections to nearly all the then crowned heads of Europe, and it's her 200th commemoration ceremony. So what better person to celebrate that with than our next guest, the fantastic Thomas Mace Archer Mills, royal consultant, royal historian, award-winning author, seen him on TV and radio, and he founded the British Monarchist Society. He's got a new book out, but before we say good morning to Thomas, let's remind ourselves of our fascination still with Victoria. There was a TV series recently Series 3 on your ITV. There's also, a couple of years ago, a rather good film about the, about the young Victoria. Have a listen. I must have been 11 or thereabouts when I learned that I was nearer to the crown than I had thought. A Royal Highness Princess Victoria of Kent. My dearest niece. How come you've grown up so well? I wasn't looking. <laughs> Now on, everyone will push you and pull you for their own advantage. The Viscount Melbourne. Should you ever need an ally, you have one in me. I pray for the strength to meet my destiny. Prince Albert. Do you ever feel like a chess piece in a game being played against your will? Do you? Constantly. So that's the young Victoria, and of course, as with Queen Elizabeth II, when we're going through, I think, heading for the third series or season, as the Yanks say, of the crown, we've also had the whole of Victoria's life committed to the big screen. For example, Judy Dench, who was fantastic in Mrs. Brown, recaptured that role relatively recently in Victoria and Abdul. Here we go. I'm 81 years of age and have almost a billion citizens. I've been in office 62 years, making me the longest-serving monarch in history. Have we finished? Abdul, you will travel to England. To the royal household. You will present the queen with a ceremonial coin. Whatever you do, you must not look at her majesty. There's a famine in India. Prime Minister, you really are terribly depressing. Yes. Her Majesty. I suddenly feel a great deal better. She has requested to Kareem be her personal footman. How do you like your Scottish costumes? They're very scratchy. Everything in Scotland is scratchy. What can they be talking about? What is a mango? The queen of fruit. I would like a mango. They only grow in India. Well, I'm Empress of India, so I have one cent. Ouch, take that with you. Delighted to welcome to the studio, absolutely live this morning, for which we're incredibly grateful, Thomas Mace Archer Mills, Royal Consultant, Top Royal Historian, award-winning author. He's got a new book out, we'll talk about it in a moment. And also the founder of the British Monarchist Society. Good morning, Thomas. Yes, good morning. Thank you for having me. Now, let's start with a chat about Queen Victoria's personality before we get on to kind of elements of her life or impact. What kind of, what kind of woman do you think she was? Obviously, people change through their life, but what was she like, do you think, as a person? She was a very daring woman. And someone who really took responsibility to the next level. But behind all of that, she was very much a woman who liked to dabble in things. She loved innovation. She loved technology. She loved her husband. She loved sex. She well, loved she was drugs. Quite, she was quite a passionate young wife, wasn't she? She was a little beyond passionate. Really? And uh, <laughs> it's really quite something. Because if you go to Osborne House, the Isle of Wight, you know, they actually installed a bolt on one of her doors there because they didn't want to be interrupted during sex. It's just the bolt they could operate from the bed. Yes. I mean, so, that's a t we could all do with that if you've got children exactly. and you're still interested in the old marital chimney who, but what a great innovation. Well, forget about the children. <laughs> Think about the servants that was coming in. That's not a problem for yeah. me. Yeah, but, <laughs> you know, for all the sex she had, she had nine children. Yeah. Didn't like any of them. She didn't like children. She wasn't nice to her children. She really? had more love for her husband than she did for her children. And of course, she was never quite the same, never really came out of mourning after she lost Prince Albert. No, no, and we have to look at the actual eroding of the monarchy during that mourning period. You know, Victoria is remembered as the empress. She was the most popular queen because she lived the longest. She broke every record. But we had a rise in, in fantastic republicanism. Yeah under Victoria. And the Chartists and the Peterloo Massacre and all that exactly. thing was fresh in people's memory. Exactly. But when we look at her lasting legacy, it's something that no one's been able to touch until no. our current group. In fact, I hadn't thought of it in that way, but you're right. Apart from this century, well, before then, 
the Victorian era kind of accelerated human technological process and she lived through that. I mean, she yeah. lived through, you know, the railway revolution. She's basically a kind of a Regency princess or Regency baby who takes us into the modern era. Exactly. And she was the first monarch to ride the steam engine. They didn't want her to. And she said, I don't really give a toss what you think. I'm wow. going to do it. I'm going to get on that locomotive and I'm going to enjoy it. Because there was a fear that people would suffocate if they travelled at more than 25 miles an hour. Exactly. Nobody knew anything no, about speed. She thought it was a load of tosh and she said, I will prove you all wrong. And she got on the locomotive and she didn't die. I was looking at footage earlier on getting ready for this interview of... Um, when she was first put on moving camera, on, on film, it was 1901. Yeah. So right to the end of her life, she wasn't shy of the next big creative and technological advance. No, and even medical advance. I mean, when we look at what they were coming out with, chloroform and all the medical advances, she was the first sovereign to undergo sedation to give birth. And a lot of people don't realize I this. never knew that. Yeah, so she was very much always pushing the boundaries. Yeah. This is the type of woman she was. She wasn't going to be manhandled either. She didn't like that. And she often fought with her prime ministers. And uh, she was prone to tantrums because she would say, no, you're not railroading me at all. Yeah. This is the way it is. I am the queen and you will do what I say. And, and when she was first born, am I right in thinking it wasn't necessarily the case she would ever be the monarch? She wasn't kind of initially thought of as, as a future queen? No, there was, of course, a lot of king playing going on, king making and all of that. And when we look at, really... The, her uncle who left her with, with no one else. It, I mean, it's just the way the family went. Yeah. Her father died, uh, her uncle died, there were no other heirs, and really, it's, it's like the current queen. Not meant to be queen, but there you are. Yeah, and of course her father only became king because of the abdication of Edward VIII. Well, exactly, exactly. But when we go to young Victoria's life, and, and a lot of listeners will be familiar if they watch the young Victoria, the Kensington system and, and what Victoria had to go through, and when we look at the young Victoria with Emily Blunt, yeah. um, fantastic representation of the Kensington system. And just how, how was the Kensington system? Well, she wasn't ever allowed to be alone. She couldn't walk down the stairs alone. She had to hold somebody's hand to walk down so, God forbid, nothing would happen to her. Oh, right. And I remember that in the film now. Things. And uh, it was a stringent way of life that she absolutely hated. And the moment she became queen... She said, I'm leaving this place. It's been nothing but sheer, utter hell for me. Wow. And she took up with Buckingham Palace. Of course, you mentioned that it was a very turbulent time politically. Yeah. And she was quite often the target of either anarchists or would-be assassins, wasn't she? Well, she survived six... Uh, assassination attempts. Astonishing. It, it is, especially at that time. She must have been a bulletproof uh, bunk bra. Well, <laughs> was it more knives and bombs in those days, I suppose? <laughs> well, you know, she was always trying new things, so why not <laughs> a different type of corset or something? But, so she'd have been a target then just for being a monarch in those days. Well, exactly, and then when we get into Empress of India and we look at all of the issues that uh, were revolving around India at the time, and uh, when she brought over her munchie, who was a, Abdul, yeah. who was originally just a servant to actually come over and present her with a coin. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Now we're leaving. And yeah. she was just enamored with this man. And the film that you spoke about earlier. Victoria and Abdul. It's a lovely film, actually. It's a lovely film. But when we look at it, of course, Hollywood likes to take their creative license as well. But when we look at the story and we look at the truth behind it, it's fascinating how the Queen of the United Kingdom and Empress of India would actually take someone at that time and relate to him. He made her her first curry and it became a staple because she loved it. She said, there's no reason I shouldn't learn about India. After all, I'm Empress of India. And it was Bejeweled in the Crown, as exactly. they often said. And you think she'd like to have gone to India? I mean, it wasn't really practical in those days, and she was an no. elderly woman by that time, but yeah. I'm sure she'd love to have seen more of her empire. Oh, but she, she would have loved it, but it was just not physically safe for her to go. Uh, they definitely would have tried to kill her, yeah. bomb her, whatever they could have done. Uh, that was just the political atmosphere then. And, and I'm right that she was well, if not at the heart of, certainly had various of her offspring, nieces, nephews, grandchildren as monarchs around Europe. Oh, yes. Well, she's known as the grandmother of Europe at the time. And uh, even her own family, her uncle was king of the Belgians, these sorts of things. So, wow. I mean, when you look at her granddaughter, uh, her grandson-in-law was the Tsar of Russia, Nicholas II. And wasn't Kaiser uh, Wilhelm II also a Yes, exactly. Nephew? So when we look at the First World War, the Great War, 
it wasn't just countries, it was a family at war as well. Like a row in the Ross house, because yeah. they're six of us. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But one thing that people don't realise is how in tune Victoria was with her family after the death of Albert. Right. And she entertained Tsar Nicholas II at Balmoral. And we don't often hear a lot of these heads of state coming to Balmoral during Victoria's time. I mean, that is a play or film waiting to happen, isn't it? The, czar, the last czar means, mm -hmm. meets his auntie, Queen Victoria. Yes, and what had happened on that visit was, was fantastic. Uh, he had gone off to other meetings and she had advised him not to go because it could be dangerous for him politically as well as physically. There was a growing anti-sentiment about the Tsar being yeah. here and all of that. And with such a serfdom had only time, been abolished, I think, in 1883 by Tsar Alexander. Yeah, Alexander. Yeah, yeah. So it, it was all around the world. It didn't matter which country you were in. There was growing political sentiments that were not sympathetic no. to crowned heads of Europe. It just wasn't that way. Now, when we look at um, the way she's presented these days, the thing that struck out, stuck out for me from the film uh, Victor and Abdul was that moment when her kind of private papers, personal papers, letters are destroyed. As an historian and as the founder of the British Monarchist Society, that must be heartbreaking for you. The lost opportunity there, Thomas. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's just... I really don't have words, but I'm going to make them as I go along. Keep it clean, big fella, keep it clean. <laughs> a travesty. And when we look at what her son did, what the family did in burning these letters, to only really understand this relationship in the present form within the last decade... So what were they frightened of? There was a passionate relationship. I mean, platonic, but passionate. The man was of colour. He wasn't white. It wasn't... He was a Muslim. This went against everything that society stood for at the, the time. The establishment stood for, yeah. Exactly. The Prime Minister didn't like it. Why do you have this man around you? He's spending your money. You've taken to him. You've raised him up. You don't raise a, raise a servant up as you've done. So she took a lot of criticism. And she kind that. of had form on that. As I mentioned the film uh, Mrs. Brown, which yes. uh, was about her gilly, Mr. Mm -hmm. Brown, and yeah, that Mr. was played by Billy Connolly. Was yes. that a similar kind of relationship? Was that different? Was she like his tr her transitional person? Well, the, yes, it was, because she did make the statement after Mr. Brown died that my second chance in life has gone the same. So... I did not know that either. Yes. So, so it's that's almost a kind of declaration of love, isn't it? Exactly, but there's been rumours that she was secretly married to him as well. Um, as a historian, we find that very So Gordon Brown might be a great, great, great <laughs> nephew. Have I made that up? <laughs> uh, there's lots of Browns. Yeah, there's lots of Browns. Forget that, Gordon. Yeah, Forget yeah. that. You're not getting a crown. Forget yeah, it, Gordon. And he's certainly not getting a Knight of the Garter or anything. Yeah, no crown either. for Brown. <laughs> no, definitely not. So they may have gone through a secret marriage ceremony. Yes, yeah, she, she was in love with Mr. Brown and he was with her as well. And uh, getting on to her edginess and her need for things. So could she be unreasonable? In. Very much unreasonable. But he knew how to tame her. That's what he did. He was the, the queen whisperer, if you will. Wow. And uh, he always kept her glass full. Always full. Uh, claret and whiskey. Malt whiskey was her favourite. Blimey, she liked her booze then. She, she She's the original lead it. I'm, I'm telling you. <laughs> you know, the girls today have nothing on Queen Victoria. Wow. At all. <laughs> so, and, the, and the celebrations and commemorations are continuing. There's all kinds of things going on. People can find out about it online. But let me ask you a couple of things about the, the British Monarchist Society. What prompted you to start that and how long has it been up and running, Thomas? Well, we've been go we started as a Facebook group in literally 2008. And then 2012, we had grown so much that we actually had to start it as a company. Right. And say, you know, we're growing, we have members. But the fundamental basis of the society is education. And in this country, I think that many people have lost their roots. They, they don't identify anymore with the importance of the monarchy. And we live in a very disposable society. So when you no longer attach value to something as the crown... The successive generations coming up that don't want to learn about it, it's not even they don't want to learn about it, they can't. The I government some, doesn't teach it. Some people might say, but actually it's outdated, it's a celebration of privilege, we're in yeah. democracy now, we're much more diverse than we used to be, and actually maybe having the empire was something we should be ashamed of. No, no, not at all. Uh, the empire was a different time, a different place, but what we've done in the modern world with the creation of the Commonwealth we celebrate diversity, we celebrate unity. The head of the Commonwealth is the Queen. 
and we, we look now, we're divisive with our politics, but the Queen is above that. So whether we're Labour, Conservative, Brexit Party, whatever you want to be, that's tearing at our social fabric. And of course, our manager was out this week, a bit like Queen Victoria, trying out her first self-checkout machine for Sainsbury's. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she wanted to get one over on it. Uh, uh, she didn't cheat. Yeah, well, well, she never has any cash on her, does she? Yeah, so she's got to, got to kind of swag it at the old uh, checkout yeah, desk. She'll say to one of her ladies, uh, do you have a uh, 10p? And you've been very generous. Um, Thomas has given me a rather fine book. I'm holding it out now. <laughs> Their Majesty's Mixers, When They Rain, R-E-I-G-N, They Pour. It's a Royal Drinkology book, Thomas. Royal Drinkology, yes. Have you got a Victoria cocktail in here? I do have a Victoria cocktail in there. And uh, it's quite interesting. It, it's not just about drinks. It's about the history of the spirits. It's about the different sovereigns that actually promoted the spirits, uh, giving royal charters and warrants to the distillers, the vintners, these sorts of things. Although I don't think, and you've got the bloody, the bloody Queen Mary, which is a nice bloody <laughs> Mary. I don't think we had much vodka in the, in the UK, did we, in the Elizabethan era? It no, wasn't no, even no. the UK then, was no, it? It was just no, England. It was just England yeah. at that time. But the rise of gin in this country is directly attributed to William and Mary. So when they came... Of course, from Holland, they exactly. from their gin distilleries. And the thing is, they had Jean Hiver, Juniper. Yeah. But they wanted to tax the spirits from Catholic countries so high, they needed to replace it with something cheap so that English could have something to do. Hence take. Mother's Ruin. Exactly. <laughs> Hogarth's Rates Progress and That's all that stuff, the is. gin shops. And you'll see in there, there's actual, um, the engraving of Hogarth's Gin Lane in there as well. So, um, let me take a quick look at the back of the book. It says it's published by Filament Publishing. Um, you can get it online, I'm sure, as well. Um, I've seen you on TV a lot of the times. I know you do a lot of work in the States, or for American television and broadcasting. Yeah. Where did your fascination for this first come from? Oh, gosh. It's, um, well, my mother's family is British. So, I grew up with all of that. Also, uh, the area I grew up in, in America, is surrounded in British history. Yeah. Lake George, named after George II, Fort William Henry, of course, uh, named after his, his son. So, and of course, I suppose New York was originally New Amsterdam, wasn't it? It was, <laughs> it was. But when we look at the French and Indian War, the Ten Years' War, the Revolutionary War, yeah. one third of those battles were fought in that area where I grew up. So British history is not just in my blood, yeah. it's also where I grew up. It, it surrounded me my entire life. And now we're, we're talking to uh, one of our regular contributors after two, a chap called uh, John Leboutier, former mm -hmm. Republican congressman. And he's a very bright guy, commentator now, polit political expert. And he always reminds us of how obsessed most Americans still are with the British royal family. I suppose that would have increased with the arrival or the welcoming in of... Uh, Meghan Markle, as she was, now the Duchess of Sussex. Yes, it, well, a lot of people, they've followed it, l literally, like there's no tomorrow. Yeah. And she, like, well, I mean, they're like a posh soap, aren't they, the royal family? With no disrespect to them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and this is the way of it. You know, they provide entertainment, but they actually have a real purpose and function. But uh, what Meghan did is fantastic, because the first American who tried this with Edward VIII failed miserably. Yeah. She cost this country their king. But she do She'd already been divorced as well, though. Megan's twice. been divorced, hasn't she? Megan once, yeah. Wallace Simpson twice. Okay. So all the Americans... But again, a different time, that was 80-odd years ago, so that was a different exactly. era, wasn't it? Yes. Exactly, yeah. But, I mean, and we look at Archie, who was just born, a mixed-race baby in the royal family. The royal family truly is saying, we are now representative of this country. You know, we're not just... Toast. I call them toast. They're a little burnt on the edges and, and white bread. That's, that's what it is. But they're changing. But this is what the institution does. It's how the monarchy stays. It changes. It modernizes. It updates to reflect the, the society of which it is in. And is it possible to speculate what Queen Victoria might have thought about society now? I mean, obviously, there have been huge changes for her. But in some ways, it seems, given that London has always been a very cosmopolitan city, given that as the empress, as she was effectively, of yeah. one of the biggest empires the world's ever known, whatever you think of it, she was used to diversity, I suppose, wasn't she? You said that yes, there were eyebrows raised about Abdul, but she'd have seen people from all over the world at her court, ambassadors, and seen people all over London. Exactly. She embraced that. She embraced unity and diversity. That's what she was about, and she wanted to learn. She had some such a, a profound yearning for education because simply she was told what they wanted her to hear and to know. Yeah. She wanted to learn things on her own and that's why the Munchi, Abdul, provided her with this education. Gave her her first mango. It, well, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But even more than that, it, it's, it's the curries, it's learning to read yeah. and write in his language, these sorts of things. And if she couldn't go there, 
he brought India to her. And, and I suppose that's that. the fascinating thing, isn't it, that it was the lack of travel possibilities. She said she embraced the railway, yes. but actually it's that inability, you know, you, you couldn't hop on a plane because the Wright no. brothers weren't until 1903 and even then you'd have been strapped to the wings. <laughs> so in that way she was very much, you know, she was, she defined her whole era, which is what I find fascinating about her. I mean, how long was she on the throne for? Oh, well, she, well, what was it? It was June, no, I'm sorry, September... 9th, 2015, that the Queen overcame her, which of was course. 63 years I mean, and so many a, days. That is six plus decades. Yes. Astonishing yes. achievement. So, and we, when we look at eras, yeah. we have the Victorian era. But it's funny because all the era, eras in the Anglo sphere are always named after British kings and queens. Yeah. We don't have uh, the Trump era. No. It doesn't work like that. We Thank don't have goodness, the Roosevelt some era. Some might say, yeah. yeah. We have the Edwardian era, the Georgian era. Yeah. And then that's now, even now the Elizabethan. We're in the Elizabethan, aren't the we? The second now? one, yeah. yes. And it's been a prosperous reign for her. And let me ask you finally, did she ever actually say, we are not amused? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> <laughs> we did you ever? No, it wasn't Queen Victoria that coined that, actually. Uh, the current queen. Yeah, and I suppose we never so, see her smiling in front of us because nobody did in those days. You had to hold a pose, didn't you, for a dagger of type? Well, uh, how did you tell whether they were alive and dead or dead? <laughs> yeah. The Victorians had this macabre sort of thing of taking albums and pictures of dead people yeah. propped up. So it, it, it was really weird. But um, she didn't smile, mostly because she was miserable after Albert died, and most of her photographs were taken after that. So she was cru he was crucial in her life, as all the yeah. TV series and the films indicate. Yeah, and that is true. I mean, after he died, she slept with a portrait of him literally tagged to the top of her bed. That must have been That's nice for Mr. Brown if they so, did, to have well, well, under the duvet <laughs> together. <laughs> under the eye of downs, it would have been then. <laughs> Isn't he been a fantastic guest, Thomas? I really Thank appreciate so the book. Once again, folks, it's called Their Majesty's Mixers. It's far more than just a cocktail book. It's a history book as well with some brilliant and very witty illustrations. And it's published by uh, Filament Publishing. If you go online, you can pick it up. It's 24.99, but I'm sure don't tell Thomas. If you shop around online, you'll get it for cheaper than that. And Thomas, you must come back and see us again. I'd love to. Thank, Thank you, you so much. very much, Eddie. What a fantastic guest. You've been listening, my friends, to Thomas Mates. Mace Archer Mills, Royal Consultant, Royal Historian, and founder of the British Monarchist Society, which you can search for online. And once again, the book's called Their Majesty's Mixers by Royal Appointment. And you heard it here on Talk Radio with me, Paul Ross. Coming up, we are talking Bank Holiday Weekend TV with a tip-top turn, the voice of ITV2, Lucy Jones, showbiz reporter, and a guide to TV for the next four days on Talk Radio, Talk of the Nation. Across.